Hi guys, uh, time for another Q&A. Uh, the question that I'm going to attempt to answer is actually a series of questions and it's uh, fairly frequent in different forms and that is uh, material specifications, material substitutions, hardware specifications, hardware substitutions and how the wartime variants are um, either available, not available or able to be substituted in a modern rebuild of an aircraft like that. So. There's a, a lot of information to this, so I'll go pretty light on it for, uh, for the purpose of this video, um, but hopefully it helps answer some of the questions that people have. And uh, I guess I'll start first with materials. The Typhoon is built primarily out of uh, aluminum, but also with a ver very large amount of uh, steel in its cockpit structure. The primary aluminums, wartime aluminums used for the production of the Typhoon were, uh, the, for the aluminum sheeting, it was L3, it's a British specification, or a DTD specification 390. And roughly that equates to uh, the more common in North America 2014 series aluminum alloys. And um, I believe the DTD 390 was just an alclad variant and the L3 would be bare. Uh, I'm st I stand to be corrected on that. It's just off the top of my head. Um, but 2014 alloy, which is a little bit softer than what most of the, the folks in North America would be used to using at 2024. It forms a little easier, but it's still a uh, a copper alloy, 2000 series alloy, aluminum. Um, so those are the primary alloys used in the airframe. There's also other aluminums used in extrusions. Um, almost the same alloys. The British specifications for these, uh, they, the spec actually calls out the alloy, which is the chemical composition, but it also includes mechanical properties and heat treatment too. So you can actually have specifications that have the same base alloy, but because they have a different um, have different mechanical properties when they're done being processed, it's actually given a different specification. So it gets fairly uh, complex to go through these things and, and convert them over. I have to uh, absolutely thank Graham Allen, our uh, propulsion systems lead for the work that he's done uh, dating back years now, uh, finding the specifications for this and rooting through them and working with me so we can try and identify exactly what they are. And uh, I mean, you can even pull up a, one of the British specifications with a reference to another spec that we don't have. And, you'll find that for us and it's it's like a, a bit of a treasure hunt but it's gold and it's absolutely essential for a rebuild of an aircraft like this so uh, those are our uh, our main aluminum alloys i think a lot of you um, that are kind of hawker gurus will be familiar with uh, t50 steel tube that's the uh, steel tube it's a british specification uh, 50 ton steel tube used in the production of the hawker typhoon's cockpit section uh, as well as the Hawker Hurricane and the Tempest cockpit section and many a biplane before that. It's a, kind of the staple um, steel tube used by Hawkers with their uh, plug ends and gussets and all that good stuff. Now, T-50 steel tube is uh, a bit of an anomaly. It's not a weldable steel tube, but it is 50 ton uh, tensile strength and um, it was used heavily. The problem with it is it's not available today. There's uh, you can have a production run of it done, which is a full mill run, uh, which is something you'd have to have a lot of people go in on. And it hasn't happened yet. I know there's a lot that would like to, though. Um, but I, what I understand is a lot of people have gone with a T-45, British spec T-45 steel tube, which is 45 ton, same alloy uh, steel tube as the T-50. And the, the T-45, actually, the upper level of the, uh, the uh, tensile range kind of falls into the lower level of what the T-50 tube uh, tensile range was for acceptable use. So you can find an overlap there if the batches are tested and you, uh, you have all that information in front of you. You can actually use the T45 in lieu of T50 where the strength uh, requirements are met. So that's my understanding of what some other people have done. I also understand that uh, 4130, the American alloy, um, 4130 steel has also been used uh, for Hawker Hurricane restorations. And um, it, ultimately when you do the comparison between T50 and 4130, there are differences in it. Obviously, 4130 is a weldable alloy. Um, the strength requirements, they can be made to meet as well. There's some different chemical composition um, between the two of them, but ultimately you can make uh, 4130, which comes, I believe, in its end condition is around 90,000 um, pounds per square inch. And if you heat treat it and bring it up to 125 KSI, uh, you're at the upper range of... Uh, the T-50 steel tube, which is about 112 KSI. Uh, one of the parts that I, when I was doing our research for this project was that we we're really looking 
uh, Elsie McGill, uh, the queen of the hurricanes with Canadian Car and Foundry, when they were building Hawker Hurricanes in Canada, we were trying to find the engi engineering documentation to see what kind of material they used because T-50 wasn't readily available here and it didn't seem logical to be shipping it from Britain. So uh, we're, we're quite sure, 90% uh, confident, that uh, CCF uh, produced the Hurricanes using 4130 anyways. So it would be really nice to find some engineering data on that and I think there's a lot of people that would be really interested in finding that if anybody knows of this. Um, so that's our tube structure and our sheet metal. The plug-ins and all the big forgings, the forged fittings on the spars, those things, um, those range in different alloys. And again, I believe almost all of those are uh, British specifications. So there's, for the steels, there's uh, a lot of S2, S11, S65 for the big wing forgings, wing pins, all that stuff for S65 steel. And again, they don't really uh, cross over. S65 was superseded by S97, I believe, and it may have been superseded again. So what you've got to do is you've got to break it down by chemical composition and mechanical properties and do a comparative uh, analysis with materials readily available or if you can find a source for those materials. I believe S97 can be found still. Um, and all the other alloys like the S2, S11 are uh, also things that can be through analysis be converted over to modern materials readily available in North America. So, um, and obtain the exact same uh, properties needed for that type. Um, that kind of bridges off into another subject though because then you're starting to look with these the steel fittings in the Typhoon, the Hurricane, any of these aircraft, you're starting to look at the difference between a, a cast component, a wrought component, or a forged component. So it's not just looking at the chemical composition and the base material strength. You have to look at how it was produced and why it was produced in that way. And it gets difficult because there's components in this aircraft that are very clearly produced using, they called them uh, stampings, but it was a forging process. They're a forged component with a final machine to it, but they're forged quite clearly for ease of production and uh, reduction of waste. So they'd be able to just stamp out all these parts and then it would have one or two machine surfaces and it's out the door. And we found these a couple times where it's as forged external service, uh, um, surface finish and even some of the uh, flashing you can just see have been sawed off and there's saw marks all over it, which is something that you don't see every day. Um, but there's different reasons behind the reason or behind the decision to use a forging over a uh, piece of wrought material or casting. Casting is kind of the low end of the spectrum. It's not used very often. Um, it's definitely the weakest of all of them, forging being stronger because it uh, changes the structure of the material and you can uh, manipulate the grain flow to give you even more resistance to fracture on there. And that's basically the only test that uh, they had in their mechanical properties lists for these components was an IZOD test, which is a fracture test. So um, that's, if you're looking at substitution of materials, you really have to look at that stuff too. Um, the why, and that's with everything. Why was it done this way or you're gonna run into some problems, so. Joining these structures is part of fasteners and I, I won't go too much into the nuts and bolts. They're hard, <laughs> they're difficult. There's a lot of AGS, which is aircraft general stores. A lot of that surviving hardware kicking around um, and I know there's a lot of guys that uh, swear by absolutely having to use that. Um, but I think I'll focus on rivets for this one because that's more my cup of tea. Uh, rivets for the Typhoon are quite interesting in themselves because they were all of a L37 alloy or almost all. I think there's some magnesium rivets used in the uh, electron skin on the ailerons. Um, but almost all of the airframe was uh, L British spec L37 rivet, which is, it actually, for North American friends, it falls between a D rivet and a DD rivet for strength. So even more confusing that way. Uh, but these L37 rivets were uh, icebox rivets, so um, they had to be heat treated before they're driven. They can't be driven as received, and they had to be kept cold um, as you're working. So. I've seen pictures of factories where they've got their little carts going along with their ice box, uh, box rivets and they're plugging away. But that poses a big problem when we're producing um, one airframe, sticking it all back together with these fasteners and you might need a handful a day. Well, um, the calibration required for correct heat treatment of fasteners gets really complex and it's not something you can really just jump into as much as I'd like to. It uh, would get quite expensive trying to maintain the certification of our furnace to keep the heat treatment up. 
and given our location, we're talking about uh, courier, overnight couriers and dry ice and things like that. Then we'll start having issues with our passengers. So it was an interesting choice from Hawker to do that. Uh, but I, I've also found some references uh, that allow for a substitution of a um, more modern alloy, which is, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't remember the British specification for it, but it's the 2117 alloy, which is a very common alloy in rivets. Um, in North America, the primary rivet used in aircraft construction. Uh, but there will also still be some, uh, likely a 2024 or a, um, a D rivet, uh, 2017 rivet, um, in some of the heavier uh, structures like the wing spars and things like that. Uh, what we see a lot with the surviving structure from the Typhoon, the aluminum bits, um, uh, surviving chunks that have come out of crash sites or, or wrecks, um, is that the bearing strength with those fasteners, the L37 rivets, the bearing strength of the material was too low. And the um, with a typical joint you, uh, for an aircraft, you want the fasteners to fail or tip before they destroy the structure around it. And quite the opposite was happening with the Typhoon and almost everything that I've seen. And that is that the material around the rivets would fail because the rivets were too strong. So it, it is possible that Hawker recognized this and that's where the reference comes from for using the, uh, the 2117 alloy uh, type of rivets in certain areas. Um, but that will really help us uh, to, to produce this. It's something that we can do here. You can drive those rivets as received and there's no worry about heat treatment, quenching, certification of that stuff, um, or keeping them in a freezer or having your rivets go bad on you. Uh, actually, that's a good question too. Uh, somebody asked if we can undo a heat treatment process. I'm gonna go into the heat treatment processes uh, in the future, as we get the frames off for heat treatment, as we get steel out for heat treatment, we'll go into detail on that, but you can redo heat treatment, uh, but it's not advisable because you, especially with an L-clad material, you start going into um, the L-clad starting to diffuse into the base metal with multiple heat treatments. I think there's actually a general rule that is a limit of two times with that material, and uh, then you better get a new piece. So. Uh, reheat treatment is good, isn't good, and you don't want to do that with rivets either. I, I believe another uh, problem that comes out of reheating uh, or reannealing rivets would be intergranular corrosion issues. So you wouldn't know about it until later. So it's best just to avoid that kind of stuff. I like to go with one kick at the cat. If that doesn't work, remake the part. It's a small price to pay to ensure safety. Um, and that's kind of the general theme. Uh, touched a little bit on magnesium. Uh, one question was if there's magnesium used in the structure and uh, sort of, yeah, the uh, aileron, <laughs> aileron skin and elevator skin, I, I believe it's a trade name, it's called electron skin plating and it's a magnesium skin. Uh, very light, survives very poorly, falls apart, just like magnesium in general. Um, I've heard and I haven't found any evidence for it, but these skins were actually being replaced with uh, thin aluminum skins during the war because they were already having corrosion issues in some of the typhoon surfaces. So if anybody can confirm that, I'd, uh, I'd love to hear a, a correct reference on it. Um, but I, I have no doubt. <laughs> it just doesn't survive well. So that's a lot of condensed information without giving you any direct answers. I'm not going to go into details on the, the work that we've done here um, on material conversions because it's going to be, or there's potential to be different um, outcomes for everybody involved with it and it's going to depend on your certifying authority, your aircraft maintenance organization, the guys that are the licenses that are signing on it and in some cases as we're going to have to go through here um, a design approval representative for Transport Canada so it takes a lot of people working together to make sure this stuff is right even for a limited category aircraft like the Hawker Typhoon will fly in so um, I'm not going to go into the details on what we've decided to do for specific alloys that's something that you're going to have to do for yourself if you're doing a project like this and you're going to have to work with your representatives and uh, the people that are authorized to make those decisions at your end. So I, I hope this helps. I hope it helps answer some questions and keep them coming, guys. I'm enjoying it. Thank you so much. Cheers.